I shot that on the video camera at Christmas. And I'd oh, that's that nice work, at, yeah. I was looking at your site the other day, mm -hmm. and I was totally blown away to find this whole thing about the squirrel. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, okay, perfect. Okay, let me see. It's got a board in there. So yeah. So the way I, I worked it is here here is the food. Mm -hmm. And um, the, the birds can have a perch here. Mm -hmm. And this is the pin that goes to the ground. And you want a free floating disc. What? A hole here. Mm -hmm. It slips in there and you put a little pin underneath. So this can go, you know. Cardboard? No, metal. Yeah. Oh, cardboard wouldn't stay in the rain, obviously. Uh, yeah, metal. You want it metal. It has to be wide enough so the damn thing can't. Right? It can't reach out to the edge. Yeah. And it floats, so you can try to move it, but push against it, but it won't go up. He can't get around it. He's looking here. And um, he sees up there and he begins to cry because he can't get there. Then they'll sometimes jump from a tree. Yeah. So you put another disc above and that, there's no way he's gonna get there. It works. First time every time. Okay, so I'll give it a go. Yeah. Do you do a lot of these? No. Do you like doing them? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> but you do them anyway. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Why? In that case? I don't know. Why don't you know? <laughs> okay. David Lynch, good evening. Good evening to you. Um, I'll start off with, why did you want to become a director? I didn't really want to become a director. I wanted to make films. I knew next door to nothing about film. I wanted to be a painter. And I was a painter. And I was in a uh, studio working on a painting of a garden at night and the green was coming out of this black and I heard a uh, wind and I saw the green move and I said oh that is interesting and I thought it would be good to do a moving painting so uh, there was an experimental painting and sculpture contest at the end of the year at the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts where I went to school and uh, for that contest, I did a sculptured screen with three heads out of polyester resin and some painting on the screen, about six feet by eight feet the screen was. And then I stop motion, kind of animated, but in a stop motion fashion, a uh, thing that I called Six Men Getting Sick. And that was my uh, film in 16 millimeter, a little tiny Bell and Howell camera that had single frame capabilities. And it was so expensive to make that film relative to what I had that I thought that would be it, that it was just an experiment. But someone saw that and commissioned me to make one for him. And that led to another whole thing. Which was? Falling in love with film and uh, getting green lights. I made um, a short film called The Alphabet and with the money I got from this gentleman who commissioned me. 
and there's there's a whole bunch of things that happened but I ended up making not what he wanted but um, something that combined animation and live action and then I wrote a script um, for a film called The Grandmother and at that time uh, the American Film Institute was starting and they were offering independent filmmaker grants and on a real long shot because they wanted previous work and a script and I had both those things so on this long shot I applied for an independent filmmakers grant and the first group um, I wasn't in the first group but and I had to wait a long time but I got a phone call that changed my life completely because I won this grant to make the grandmother and I made the grandmother and on the strength of that I got accepted to the American Film Institute which was in Beverly Hills California in a mansion um, and I thought I'd died and gone to heaven. So I went out there and uh, one thing led to another and I got the opportunity to make Eraserhead. Do you consider yourself a visual artist or a filmmaker? You know, we can do many, many things and I don't think it's, um, it, it, people get pigeonholed all the time as we know, but we have so many things in us that um, there's, there's titles don't uh, say the whole story. So you, you go where the ideas take you or the inspiration, you know, like that. One of the most remarkable things about Eraserhead for me was, was, is that out of it, Mel Brooks offered you Elephant Man and George Lucas allegedly offered you Return of the Jedi. Well, one thing came first, Mel Brooks, um, and that's another whole story, but um, Mel Brooks, uh, I, and I don't know how this beautiful uh, thing happened, but um, I'm forever thankful to Mel. He took a chance on me based on what he saw in Eraserhead. No, you can ask me another two questions, another two if they're questions. brief, yes. If they're brief, okay. Well, I spent an hour with David Lynch in January. You did? Yeah, interviewing him. Was his button, was, was he was, wearing? Of course it was. White shirt, Closed, him, white shirt black, button. Black, 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 uh, black jacket. Black, black jacket. jacket. Incredibly nice man. Of course, we talked about the Elephant Man, and of course, you came up. Yes. Uh, Nobody uh, knows that I produced the Elephant Man. Well, this is your chance yes. to tell us what yeah. it was you saw in a razor head that you wanted to give him the Elephant Man. You know what I saw, and that's a very good question, Stuart. What I saw in Eraserhead was symbolism that was not murky, symbolism that was clear. That baby was a monster. It took over the I saw everything he wanted to say, so realistically and symbolically, he said very brilliantly, very clearly. And I said, this guy will be a great filmmaker, and I'm going to grab him first, and he's going to direct this script, The Elephant Man. And he came in, he helped rewrite it, he helped on the makeup, and he helped on the beautiful black and white, you know, photography. David Lynch is a bit of a genius, he really is. Why didn't you want it, your, your name on it more? Because when you say Mel Brooks, the audience kind of breaks into a smile. They're not ready for something as heavy as The Elephant Man. They're ready for songs and dances. They're ready for, for jokes, they're, you know. So I don't want to, you know, I don't want to upset the apple cart, so to speak, so. And it was the Elephant Man that um, somehow got George Lucas to offer me that, that uh, third Star Wars. Can you imagine why? Because I think um, George really doesn't like to direct and he wanted somebody that um, maybe worked with you know actors felt comfortable and like that and um, you know the elephant man was was sort of in the in the air during those days was there any talk ever of the elephant man being in color never 
would you even consider it? No. There's, um, black and white is magical. Um, when you go back in time or to another world, black and white is very, very beautiful for that. And um, there's, a, there's a feel to it. Some things should be told, stories should be told in black and white. And it's pretty obvious. Um, it really helps slip back in time. Were you surprised that the Oscar nomination is from Never Home? Very surprised. And when you did a razor head, I mean, were you looking at to launch a career in? Uh, no, you, no, 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 no. There's no launching a career. You, you know, they call it a film business, but money is the last thing um, a person should be thinking about in my book. The last thing, you fall in love with ideas and you get fired up and you go and you try to translate those ideas into, into cinema. And it's a beautiful, beautiful journey. And so it has nothing to do with any kind of career it has to do with the loving of doing. It's a very expensive thing to do because you love it. It is, but um, where there's a will, there's a way. And, and yet, uh, you have to have a certain amount of good fortune um, to keep getting that money or to, you know, a lot of will to uh, spend time to, to get it. Eraserhead took five years to make because I ran out of the American Film Institute money and I had to raise money to shoot a scene, then stop, raise money to shoot a scene, stop, and go like that till it was finished. So the only thing on your mind during the making of Razorhead was actually to get the film made and anything that came after was... I, you, when you're in the middle of something, it's next door to impossible to think about um, another thing, another film. You just want to finish this. And, um, and that's, that's frustrating, but there's also something good about staying in a film uh, for a certain amount of time because you sort of can sink deeper into it. Can I ask you why you considered Dune a disappointment? Dune, I didn't have final cut on. It's the only film I've made that I didn't have. I didn't technically have final cut on The Elephant Man but Mel Brooks gave it to me. And on Dune, I started selling out, even in the script phase, uh, knowing I didn't have Final Cut. Um, and I, I sold out. So it was, um, it was a slow dying the death and a m terrible, terrible experience. Do you regret making it? Yes, uh, except um, it just nailed <laughs> this idea, never, ever do a film without Final Cut. And um, why would I have done it? I don't know how it happened. I trusted that it would work out, but um, it was very naive and um, the wrong move. It's got a lot of fans. There's some things about it, but overall, it was squeezed because in those days, um, the maximum length they figured I could have is two hours and 17 minutes, and that's what the film is. So they could get, they wouldn't lose a screening a day. And so it's, again, money talking and not for the film at all. And so it was like compacted and um, it hurt it. It hurt it. I mean, everyone's been, there's been talk for years about a, a, your version of it, which does not exist. No, it doesn't exist. There is no other version. There's more stuff, but even that uh, is, is putrefied. So then along came Blue Velvet, and, and you had final cut on that. I had final cut. I had to cut my salary in half, cut the budget, and, uh, but I had freedom. And I, when you have a failure, it's in some ways kind of beautiful because there's nowhere to go but up. 
and it gives you a sense of freedom. So that was kind of beautiful. And I really enjoyed working on Blue Velvet. I, I was telling somebody today that there were 13 films Dina was making, and we were the lowest budget, uh, the least regarded um, uh, of those films. And so it was off everybody's radar, a very good sense of freedom all the way through. How do you write? Well, you catch ideas. And a script is pretty important, but it's not, you know, um, it's, it's an organization of ideas and many things are worked out in the script form, but like they say, it's a blueprint for a house. It's, it's, the house is the goal and a uh, blueprint can be a nice thing, but it isn't the house. The same way with the script, it's not the film. So, but it helps you uh, find the structure and uh, organize things to a certain degree and it goes always uh, bit by bit. It just doesn't, you don't see the whole thing at once. And the way it unfolds is, is anybody's guess. Um, it's kind of a magical thing, but um, eventually it gets there. When you say it's anybody's guess, does that include you? Oh, for sure. Ideas are the number one thing. And if you have some, it, if you have the first idea, that's the most critical one. And then I say it's like bait in fishing. That idea will, if you focus on it, it'll, it'll draw other ideas in. And, but you don't know, like fishing, you have to have patience. You don't know how long it'll take, but if you keep focusing on it and, and wiggle the line a little bit, it, it'll bring them in. How interested are you in logic in any traditional sense because some of the films do? No, no, all of them have a logic. I'm very interested in logic, but there's logic is not like, um, there's, there's a kind of a, You know, like um, there's it. It goes to toward abstraction. There can be logical things that are abstract. It's it's a. I really love intuition. I love intuition. And to me, what they told me is intuition is the intellect and emotions swimming together. It's like a knowingness, and a logic means it feels correct and it's logical it's logical but not in a in a kind of a uh there's degrees of it do you feel that people when they see films in the movie theater are expecting too readily something to be explained away by the ending basically come out going oh i know what it was about you know there's nothing wrong with that and that's very satisfying um, to, to know what's going on. But at the same time, I love abstractions. And, and the power of cinema to tell abstractions is huge. So um, it's as if people either don't have so much intuition or they don't trust their intuition or whatever. And there's, um, there's a lot of noise in the cinema. And if you're not paying attention, because every little thing is, is gotta be right, and, and you can, you can kinda, you gotta get into that world, uh, and then trust your own intuition. Do you use your intuition with casting? You use it 24 seven, and, um, in casting, I, I first start by looking at pictures and I pick these pictures saying that person could do this or this person could do this and everybody knows that pictures are kind of deceiving sometimes 
So I need to meet with the people and I just like to talk to them and I like to look at them and talk to them. And I can, while talking to them, run them through the f scenes and some uh, make it through so, uh, and, and they marry to the part. And, but I never do make them do readings or anything like that. And I like talking to them and, I, and you can kind of get a, a feel for that. And that's, that's, you could say that's an intuitive way of going. And sometimes I brought somebody in for a certain thing and in talking to them, somehow they're right for something else. Is there a collaboration with the actor or do you pretty much impose what you want? No, there's a collaboration. It's um, the idea dictates everything. So in all departments of a film, you try to stay true to that original idea. And it's a process. An actor, you know, like there's two actors in a scene and you've picked this scene to rehearse to nail down these characters. And so you need to start somewhere. So you start and you rehearse the scene. And after the first rehearsal, like I say, you may be far, far away or close, but if it's not right in that line of the original idea, then you start talking. And you talk and you talk, and then you rehearse, and you see that those words worked, but these words didn't work. So you talk some more, talk some more, and it gets closer and closer, and you talk and rehearse, talk and rehearse, and then suddenly um, they'll catch it. And it'll be like, they're right in that original idea and they feel something. And if they remember that, that's why it's important to rehearse, you know, before each thing, um, you, they, they, a light goes on, you know, they, they feel they got it. You had a very close relationship with the sound of Alan Split. Mm -hmm. You remind me a little bit of Al. How important was he slash sound design slash music? I loved working with Al. Um, you know, uh, Alan, uh, I have, you know, ideas about um, sound and music and, you know, the whole thing, but I need to work with technically, you know, very good people to get those things. And Al uh, was at first a technician, but we, had so much fun working together um, that Alan actually pushed me, you know, further. And uh, it was a great collaboration. Uh, work, we started working together on The Grandmother and at this little, stu um, you know, uh, I don't know what you call it, a production facility called Calvin Dufresne that made mostly industrial films and they had hardly any sound equipment. They had no reverb machine, and Al would play the sound through these air ducts and then re-record it at the other end. And this is how we just kept recording it through to get a longer and longer reverb, things like this. So it was a fantastic experience. And out as a result of the grandmother, I was accepted to AFI as a student, and Al was accepted to AFI as the head of the sound department. So um, I had my best friend, um, one of my best friends, uh, with all this equipment that I could get a hold of any time I wanted. It was a very, you know, beautiful thing. And music? Music? I was a person, I loved sound, sound effects, like I say, these hard effects, and then effects that got more abstract and bridge a gap between sound effects and music. But I never got into music really um, until I met Angelo Badalamenti. And I always say Angelo brought me into the world of music. And I didn't, I, I'm not a musician, um, but here I was in this world which is a fantastic world. And I 
I got more and more involved in it. And I, I owe that admission into that world to Angelo. Why do you play music on the set? Well, no, sometimes I do. Um, sometimes I like to uh, get a mood going. And so, and then sometimes I like to listen to music um, along with the dialogue. And no one else hears that. Sometimes the DP hears it, but it gets a pace. If I know that music is the right feel, and, and it's amazing because if you um, don't hear it, and later hear the dialogue of the pace of that, you know, uh, or a certain kind of thing, it, it's, a, it's a hair off. But if you're listening to the music, you can tell all the time if it's in the, the right feel. I don't do it all the time, but sometimes if I know the music up front, I do it. Violence. The films are often, some of them, get criticized as violent. There's violence in them, and, um, you know, stories, uh, like I say, a lot of times um, film reflects the world we live in. And we live in a very violent, you know, world. Even though it may be getting, you know, better, it's, it's, um, it's you know, out there. And stories that go to, you know, toward life and death struggles are kind of uh, make you lean forward more. Why did you do the straight story? I wasn't going to do the straight story. Um, and I live with Mary Sweeney and I knew she was working on it. She worked on it for three, three and a half years and with her f childhood friend John Roach and I'd hear all about it. I had zero interest. And when they finished the script, uh, they gave it to me to read. And when I read it, I felt these things. And I thought, oh man, that is really beautiful. And I thought that, you know, cinema could, you know, get that, you know, emotion. And in a way it was, you know, there was, a, it was a straight line kind of film. It was lean. And so it was delicate. And anyway, I fell in love with the emotion of that. And, you know, consequently met, I already knew Sissy Spacek, but meeting and working with Richard Farnsworth, it was a, he was just perfect. And so, but it was the emotion of it, of the piece that got me going and how to get that, how to get that, try to get that. What would you say to people who suggest it's not a real David Lynch? Well, I, I mean, it's like, um, I would say I understand what they're talking about, but at the same time, uh, that's one of those things. Um, we're all capable of doing, you know, many types of things, and it's what you fall in love with. So in your mind, what is a David Lynch? I have n no earthly idea. So when you say it's Lynchian, what on earth are they talking about? That's, that's um, I don't want to know. I just want to fall in love with ideas. That's the most thrilling thing, to catch an idea that you fall in love with, and you know what to do. Um, you have your own website, don't you? I do have my own website, yes. So have you found that the internet has given you a whole new dimension in which to move? The internet is amazing. And it's, it's so strange to me that it wasn't there, and then, and then it's there. And it, I don't know where exactly it is. It's, it's like this ether. It's in the ether or someplace. And um, so fantastic. Uh, suddenly another whole opportunity, a whole other world popped up. And it um, led to, um, you know, me like learning, you know, uh, things on the computer, which I really like. And on that website, you have put short films. Some short experiments, yeah. Short experiments. Do you see short films as short experiments? No. I, there's this, you know, uh, dead mouse, you know, c with ants on it. 
and, and I shot that and then added sounds to it. I, it's not a film to me. Uh, it's, I call it an experiment. Do you see any value in them? Yes, um, because along the way I fell in love with uh, digital video and uh, now I love digital video and I'm through with film. You're moving to digital video? Yeah. Why? A um, huge amount of reasons. Even though I love film, it's a dinosaur and everything about it is a dinosaur and it's soon to be gone pretty much forever. It happened in sound first. Tape analog is so gone, you can't even get a roll of tape, hardly. And um, everything's digital. The same thing with image. And the photochemical process to you is? Dinosaur, a dinosaur, dead. Completely ridiculous. Ridiculous? Yeah, it it's scratches, it breaks, it's dirty. Nothing but dirt on it. Um, and no two prints are the same. It's a nightmare. You can hear the projectors chattering. It's in. It's it's a it's a nightmare. <laughs> You're not a cinema romantic. I I just love cinema. I love I love it, but I don't want to go there anymore. You don't use digital effects, do you? Well, I mean, if you shoot with DV, you're you're shooting digital, so everything is a digital effect. Um, you know, my stuff is kind of low budget, and um, so I, you know, digital effects are anything that, you know, you, if you manipulate something in the digital world, it's an eff it, I guess it's an effect, but you have so many tools available, and you go for a thing that, based on the idea, you just let the ideas keep talking and talking, but you have so many tools. And um, like what Pro Tools did for sound is just huge, huge. It's unbelievable the amount of control you have, and it's it's a beautiful world. I I worked on the DVD for Eraserhead, so I did a high def master. Then it went to you know what's the, what's the next Digibeta. Then it goes I guess it gets compressed more. So you think man this compression is gonna it's gonna be a nightmare. And I and it was cleaned and cleaned and you know tweaked. And uh, I, I, you know, worked on this thing, went into my screening room, and I had a, I got a new digital projector. And I put this little thin plate DVD in a little machine, and it squirts on the screen, and it was like the best I'd ever seen Eraserhead. Huge sound beautiful blacks and whites, no dirt, and it really held up on a, on a pretty big 22 foot wide screen. Do you have any short comments about Mark Holland Drive? No. Um, uh, like everybody knows, uh, you know, or some people know, it started out being a, a pilot for a television show and so that was an interesting way to, to get to a feature. And uh, I was very fortunate to get the ideas after the fact to, you know, um, to not make it open-ended, to close it, you know, in a way that felt good to me uh, for a feature. So the fact that ABC rejected it, uh to me is a blessing, a huge blessing. Lost Highway, probably considered the darkest, most incomprehensible memory element in your work. Mm -hmm. Do you see it as dark and incomprehensible? I see it as, um, there's this thing, I, I now, looking back, um, I see it as um, starting uh, with the O.J. Simpson trial that I was kind of obsessed with. And it, it struck me uh, how someone could uh, do m murders and then go on living 
uh, with themselves. So that that sort of that idea uh, led to you know uh, my first you know visits with Barry and Barry Gifford, and we were talking and kind of talking about things, and and it just um, something you know uh, clicked, and we started you know working on this and in working on it, found out there is a med med medical um, uh, name for this thing, a psychogenic fugue, where the mind tricks itself and uh, you can either take on another identity or, or you do what you have to do to um, hide uh, those things from yourself. Does duality play a lot in your work? Well, yeah, duality, yeah, um, yeah. That's all you have to say. Yeah. <laughs> Inland Empire. Inland Empire is a film I'm working on right now. And it's going to stay in the box. Uh, you, I'm not, you mean I'm not going to talk about it? Well, I, I say the, that it's about a woman in trouble and um, I'm shooting on DV. And it's, it's not finished yet. And I'm finding my way. Why does Sailor Ripley call Lula Peanut? Why does he call her Peanut? You're going to have to ask Barry Gifford that. <laughs> Is How do you look back on your career? Do you think you've been lucky? I mean, not to call it a career. No, no, uh, there's, there's fate, or you could say luck, or whatever you want to call it, plays a huge role in our lives. There's things that have happened to me that I can't really believe, and the thought that they didn't ha wouldn't happen, you know, where would, where would we be without certain, you know, great good fortune that seems to just to come out of nowhere? It's a beautiful, beautiful thing, huge role in our lives. And there are, I know, we, we all, you know, know there are people out there with talent, maybe even great, great talent, and they just can't get arrested. How come? It's just, the, it's just fate plays a role. Okay. Thank you very much indeed. My pl pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you for everything you've damn well done. Oh, bless your heart.